On March 15, 2022, Yavapai County Sheriff's Office announced that Little Miss Nobody, the young Jane Doe found in the Arizona desert in 1960, had been identified. She was actually four-year-old Sharon Lee Gallegos, who had been kidnapped from the alley behind her grandmother's home only 10 days before she had been found dead. Now, after all this time, we can begin to fully tell Sharon's story, not just the little we knew from when she was found dead and became known as Little Miss Nobody. And though the 62-year mystery of who Little Miss Nobody is has been solved, we are now faced with solving the 62-year mystery of who took Sharon and why. Hi everyone, I'm Victoria and welcome to Black Cat Crimes. Today we're going to be covering the cases of the Jane Doe, Little Miss Nobody, and the kidnapped four-year-old Sharon Lee Gallegos. They are now one in the same case as we know that Sharon is in fact Little Miss Nobody. Sharon's story is short as she was taken much too soon from this world, but I'm hoping that now that we know who Little Miss Nobody is and where Sharon ended up after she was kidnapped, we will now be able to work on solving the mystery of who killed her and why. Sharon Lee Gallegos was born September 6, 1955 to her mother Guadalupe Gallegos and to her father, who was a soldier who left while Lupe was still pregnant and would have no further contact with the family. From the stories that have been shared, it was obvious that Lupi took great care of Sharon, her other relatives, and her other children. She was a wonderful mother and caretaker to Sharon and the rest of the family. Their family lived in a home in Alamogordo, New Mexico, with Sharon, Lupi, Sharon's grandmother, her two siblings, her aunt, and some cousins. Lupi worked as a hotel maid to help provide for the family, and while they were not wealthy, they were a very happy family who loved each other very much. And that is why Sharon is described as a happy little girl. She was feisty and happy-go-lucky, and she loved playing with the other children in the neighborhood, whether they be her own siblings, her cousins, or other children nearby. And at four years old, in 1960, one of her favorite activities was going to the grocery store to pick up groceries for her mother. So I've really only seen one picture of Sharon in the newspapers. Um, there's another picture of her where it's really dark and you can barely see her. She's like three at the time, but the main one that we've seen that's been in my video already and will probably be in the video even more because it's really the only picture we have of her. She is just so precious. She's got that little like half toddler smile that's like oh you're taking a picture of me but i i just love that little toddler smile and i looking at that i can imagine how much she lit up the world around her and how much she meant to her family at four years old in 1960 sharon was approximately 36 inches tall about 40 pounds and she had shoulder length light brown hair um i've seen it described a couple different ways. Sometimes it's blonde, sometimes it's light brown, sometimes it's just brown. I'm going to lean towards it being described as brown because that is the most prominent description, but from what I can tell it was a lighter brown, not like it's super deep brown. And though she was Hispanic, she had very fair skin, and as a matter of fact, they called her La Juera, which meant that she was very fair, she was very pale. Um, and that was what her family called her because she was so much fairer than the rest of her family. But even with all these happy memories, unfortunately, this sweet baby girl would be taken from the arms of her family much too soon. On July 21st, 1960, Sharon was playing in the alley behind her grandmother's house with two other young family members. While she was playing, she was wearing no shirt, pink shorts, and white sandals. As they were playing, a dark green sedan pulled up into the alley behind their house. The woman who got out of the car approached Sharon. She offered to buy her candy and new clothes if she would come with them, but Sharon refused because she didn't want to. This woman refused to take no for an answer, grabbed Sharon by the arm, dragged her into the car, and the man who had been waiting as the getaway driver drove off with Sharon in their possession. 
Despite the fact that it was broad daylight, there were other children in the alley, and multiple adult witnesses are nearby, they still snatched Sharon right from behind her own home. Sharon's aunt Beatrice, who'd been inside the home in the kitchen, heard the commotion outside from the other kids and quickly came to the back door. They shouted that the dark green sedan had Sharon and her aunt instantly tried to spring into action. She saw the car speeding away and her first instinct was to jump into her own car and follow. Unfortunately though, Beatrice had trouble seeing and couldn't drive. And because she had trouble seeing, that meant she couldn't see the license plate that was on the back of the car. Instead, she ran to get Loopy for help and call the police. Loopy immediately called the authorities to tell them of Sharon's abduction. And this is amazing because in a lot of these cases, especially in the 60s with a Hispanic family who didn't have a lot of money, you could have very likely heard that you know, this was a misunderstanding, and maybe it's because there were so many witnesses and this was broad daylight. I mean, this was a bold kidnapping, and thankfully the police didn't brush anything off. They heard that a young girl had been snatched and taken, and so they instantly sprang into action. Police were instantly sent to the house to begin interviewing people. Police spread through the town looking for this dark green sedan, and even within an hour, there were police at the Texas-New Mexico border searching any car that looked like this dark green sedan that the children had described as taking Sharon from the home. When police arrived at the Gallegos home, they instantly began interviewing the family. Newspapers at the time revealed that the children's stories varied a little bit, but overall they had the same overarching thread of what happened. This is what we know from what the children told us. The couple pulled up in a dark green sedan possibly with one or two children in the car. And when they pulled up, the woman got out of the car. The woman is described as, and I quote, fat with dirty blonde hair, a red or ruddy complexion, and had brown eyes. The man was described as a thin white Anglo man with a very hooked nose. His nose was his most defining feature, though no one got a great look at him because he was in the car. When the woman approached Sharon, she offered to give her candy and clothes in exchange for Sharon coming with them, but Sharon refused. She instantly became upset, and the woman snatched Sharon by the elbow, dragged her into the car, and they quickly drove off. Sharon's aunt, unfortunately, was too far away to see the license plate or the abductors well because of her vision problems. The scariest part is through interviews with the family, it became obvious that this dark green car had been seen more than once and was actually very upsetting to Sharon. As a matter of fact, they had seen it parked behind the very alley behind their house at least one time before. One of the children who had witnessed the abduction told another story about the dark green sedan. There was a day where Sharon was asked to go pick up a bottle of ketchup from her by her mother. and she didn't want to go. She was a little worried and just didn't seem to want to go. So this um, friend, I don't know if it was a cousin or just a friend, she was about 11 years old, offered to go with her. So they went to the store together and on their way back, they ran into this dark green sedan and Sharon became instantly upset and refused to walk past it. She began to cry a little bit and asked to be picked up. So the friend picked her up carried her past the car, and then once they were a safe distance away, they continued walking home together. The family explained that in the weeks before her abduction, Sharon had begun to change a little bit. She'd been quiet and more worrisome, and she had had multiple incidences where she'd seen this dark green sedan and become upset. I don't know if there was more than one incident where she asked to be carried past the dark green sedan. I think that was the only time she'd asked to be carried, but from what I can tell, she had seen it multiple times with different people and becomes upset every single time. And according to interviews at the time with Loopy, it could be said that there were possibly incidents where Sharon had been on her own and had been accosted by the people in this car before. We don't know to what extent that could be, but Loopy guessed that judging by the fact Sharon was so upset every time she saw this car, that it's very likely this wasn't the first time she'd had a run-in with these people. And unfortunately, more disturbing stories would come to light as the investigators moved on to talk to friends, 
family, and neighbors in the area. Five days before her abduction, Sharon and Loopy attended church at their usual place of worship. After they left, a woman with two children, possibly a young girl and a freckle-faced boy, approached the congregants and began asking questions about Sharon and Loopy. As investigators began talking to their neighbors, one woman, Mrs. Helen Gonzalez, would tell them that one to two days before Sharon was taken, a woman came to her house to ask her questions about Loopy. She asked about Loopy's financial situation and if she had many children. She also specifically asked if Loopy had a little girl. When Mrs. Gonzalez began asking the woman why she was asking so many questions about her neighbor Loopy, the woman offered that she was hoping to offer Loopy a job. And that was why she was asking so many questions. And with this explanation, the neighbor then pointed out the Gallegos home to the woman who had been asking her questions. Another friend who had been visiting the family said that they saw the 1951-1952 the Dodge sedan. She, could, she thought it was probably a Dodge sitting outside in that very alley that Sharon would be taken from with the woman in the car. This young girl who was about 16, made eye contact with the woman in the car, and this woman just stared her down. And Mary decided to stand in the doorway of the house and stare the woman down, assuming that she would eventually give up and drive away, because obviously that's weird behavior to be in a staring contest with a grown woman who's behind your house for some reason. Um, but the woman really didn't, and I think she did eventually drive away because this wasn't the same day Sharon was kidnapped, but, I mean, how odd that to just be that blatant in your behavior. It was one of the many stories that was very odd about these people. The day after Sharon was taken, Loopy did an interview with the Alamogordo Daily News, and she had this to say, She's my baby, and I miss her. I love her so very much. Loopy couldn't think of anyone who would want to take Sharon, and all she could do was beg for her baby to be returned home. Following the interviews with family members and neighbors, investigators believe they had five main theories in the abduction of Sharon Lee Gallegos. Their first theory was that it was a relative or acquaintance. This makes a lot of sense because most children are taken by people they know. Um, one of their main theories that it was possibly her father, though he had had no contact with the family since before Sharon was born, so it seemed unlikely that he would have taken her now, but they still decided to pursue this line of questioning just to be sure that there wasn't someone close to them who had taken her. Their second theory was that a transient couple could have seen Sharon and decided to take her. There were a lot of construction projects going on in the area, and they thought that maybe someone connected to the construction work had seen her, decided they wanted to take her, and then fled the area afterwards. Their third theory, in my opinion, makes sense and doesn't make sense at the same time. Um, they thought that it may have been a couple who lost a child who looked like Sharon or were childless and had been unable to adopt. While I think that they could have lost a child who looked like Sharon, saw her, become obsessed with her, and then taken her, the thought that they're childless or unable to adopt doesn't quite make much sense because they were seen a few times with two children in their car or near them. Um, could these have also been kidnapped children? That's a possibility. But the idea that they're childless and couldn't adopt just doesn't sit right with me because we do know that they were possibly seen with two other children. Their fourth theory was that this could be a man who was actually dressed as a woman to throw off any witnesses who had seen them, which, I mean, considering they snatched her and broad daylight would make sense that they would have tried to disguise themselves to some extent. Um, but I mean, the one, the main issue I have with this theory is that there are at least a few people who got a really good look at the woman. And so if sh this woman was actually a man dressed up as a woman, I feel like the neighbor who spoke directly to her, the church con congregants who spoke directly to her, the cousin, or I mean family friend, who stared her down from inside the house would have recognized that this was actually a man and not a woman. Um, you know, it could have been a man who disguised himself as a woman so that Sharon would hopefully be more comfortable if he approached her.
but obviously that didn't work, and so they just decided to snatch her. This theory just doesn't sit with me. It really does seem like it was a man and a woman, considering multiple witness statements across several days said that there was a woman involved, but I can see why they thought this. And their fifth theory, I don't know that it's really a theory, it just is something that they were saying about the couple is that one or both of the people who took Sharon could have been suffering from mental illness or some sort of emotional disturbance. I think this lines up with several of their theories, especially the one where this couple could have lost a child or been unable to adopt children. I think that you have to be emotionally disturbed to take a child. I don't know that you necessarily have to have a mental illness. I know there are lots of people who are completely sane who do this and just because you have a mental illness doesn't mean you become an evil person, but definitely I can't imagine that you would have normal emotions and be able to take a child from anybody. But by July 28th, the Gallegos family and their acquaintances had been ruled out of these theories. The police could find no connection between family and friends and those who kidnapped Sharon, so they were officially ruled out and they decided to focus on other lines of inquiry. Unfortunately though, this conclusion wouldn't help as Sharon's body would be found three days later in Arizona. On July 31st, 1960, in Congress, Arizona, Russell Allen and his family would stumble across a horrible discovery. As they were searching for rocks in the Sandwash Creek bed, they would stumble across the half-buried body of Little Miss Nobody. When they made this discovery, they called investigators who came right away to find the body. They found a young girl with auburn hair wearing pink shorts and a blue shirt. It was a button-up shirt, but it only had one button left on it, and it had a distinct vertical white line pattern on it, um, and she was wearing men's flip-flops that had been cut into child sandals with a leather strap that helped keep them stuck to her feet. Additionally, her fingernails and toenails were painted red. Unfortunately, her body was very decomposed and they couldn't tell immediately what this girl looked like or what her cause of death was just by walking up to the crime scene. In the scene around her body, they also found two sets of footprints. One set of footprints thought to be made by man's feet and then another by the little sandals that had been cut to fit the little girl's feet. Additionally, near her body, police found a knife with what appeared to be blood stains on the blade, though there was no blood or any sign of a crime scene directly in the area. After the area around her body had been investigated, police collected her body and took her to Widmer Funeral Home for an autopsy. The autopsy was conducted by the funeral director. During this autopsy, her manner of death was found to be homicide, though her cause of death could not be determined due to her extreme decomposition. The funeral director discovered that her hair, which looked auburn, was actually dyed or tinted. Underneath the color, it was actually brown. Additionally, her hair was short around her chin, cut into a bob, kind of like a page boy haircut. They thought she was probably between six and eight years old, about 42 inches to 52 inches tall, and between 55 and 60 pounds. They believed she was white. This young girl had a full set of baby teeth that were perfectly intact. Due to the decomposition of the young girl's body, they believed she'd been dead for about 10 to 14 days and had been buried likely just as long. Judging by the fact that they couldn't determine a cause of death or really come up with a description of her beyond her hair and possible height and weight, I have to assume that she was very decomposed and because of this, they had no choice but to release a very vague description of this young girl to the public quickly. A newspaper at the time, the Arizona Republic, shared an illustration of what this girl was believed to have looked like and what she was wearing when she was found dead. She, according to this illustration, looks tall and thin and has a very short bob. Merely days after this young girl's body was found, New Mexico police contacted the Arizona police to let them know that they believed this young girl was very likely the kidnapped Sharon Lee Gallegos. After all, she was a four-year-old with brown hair, 
who had been wearing pink shorts at the time of her kidnapping. Though the Arizona police didn't think that Sharon would be the young victim that they found in that desert, they did pursue this line of inquiry. At the time, DNA was practically non-existent. Actually, I don't think that any sort of DNA testing was a thing in the 1960s. So all they could do was compare what they knew about the young girl who'd been found in the desert and Sharon. So let's talk about what the differences and similarities were between Sharon and this young girl that they'd found. The biggest difference that they held on to was that Sharon was four years old and they believed their Jane Doe was between six and eight years old. And that's a pretty big age difference. Also, they believe this girl would have been much taller than Sharon. For instance, Sharon was about 36 inches tall, and the shortest this girl was believed to be was 42 inches. Also, the hair length was different, so Sharon had shoulder-length brown hair, so it would have come down to about here on her, but the young girl found in the desert, her hair was cut up a little bit above her chin, so that's a pretty significant difference in hair length. I don't know that that's the best judge because, of course, hair is pretty easy to cut, but that was one of their factors that they listened to at the time. Now let's talk about the clothing because the girl was wearing red shorts, pinkish red. You see, there's an ever-changing description of those shorts that were found on Little Miss Nobody. In the early, early, early newspapers that I found published the day after she was found, and even the day after that, these shorts were described as pink. Everything says they're pink shorts. But then, merely days after that, by like August 5th, they were calling them pinkish red. And then merely days after that, these shorts are being called red. And so I have to wonder if this quick, quick, quick turnaround of this one little detail may have been the confusion of whether or not her clothes were similar because obviously, I mean, when you're four and you're not wearing a shirt, it's not a big deal. Little kids run around without shirts on all the time. So adding a shirt to her already existing outfit really wouldn't have been super noticeable. But the fact that those shorts so quickly changed description in newspapers, I feel has to play a role in the fact that Sharon wouldn't be identified as Little Miss Nobody or that that niggling little bit of doubt would have said, hey, you know they were both wearing pink shorts, maybe this could be her. But moving on from the shorts, like I said, Sharon wasn't wearing a shirt at the time of her disappearance, and this blue shirt was not something that the family had described to them. Her shoes were different. She'd been wearing white sandals at the time of her disappearance, and now she was wearing these men's flip-flops that had been cut to fit her. Additionally, her fingernails and toenails had been painted red. And I think another thing that really led to this doubt that this would have been Sharon was that the funeral director determined that the young girl they found in the desert had been dead and buried for 10 to 14 days already. But Sharon had only been missing for 10 days. And so they didn't think that this could be her for that reason. Though they had their doubts, they still did everything they could forensically to confirm whether or not this girl they found in the desert was also Sharon Lee Gallegos. They gathered Sharon's footprint from Loopy and sent it off to the FBI to be compared to the young girl's footprint. They found that these were definitely not a match and made the determination at the time that Sharon was in fact not Little Miss Nobody. And because of this determination, investigators moved on in their theories, searching for other possibilities. They did a lot of searching, in fact. Um, I was very surprised at who they managed to track down. In the southwest area, there was a lot of transient workers, and there were a lot of families who moved around because it was a very migrant-heavy area at the time. And so there had been young girls who'd been reported missing that nobody had found. And so the police tracked down these migrant families who had, you know, had young daughters go missing. And so when they came in contact with them, they found out that the girls were safe and back with their family. And so one by one, these girls were ticked off the boxes of who could have been this young girl found in the desert. One thing that I think is really interesting that the Arizona police felt that, you know, this really wasn't Sharon, that wasn't likely, was that at the same time in New Mexico, 
newspapers were, were reporting that this was like a match. There was no way this wasn't a little girl because they were both wearing pink shorts and had brown hair. Um, which, I mean, that goes back to what I said about the shorts changing colors, changing colors so quickly in the description of the newspaper. And I do have a theory for why that is. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, but, you know, it's, it's so interesting that, like, in New Mexico, the papers were like, yep, this is her. It's going to be nearly positive that it's her because they're super similar. But at the same time, the Arizona police are thinking, you know, this really doesn't seem like her. They're different ages. They're different heights. Yeah, you know, there's a couple similarities. They're both wearing these, like, pinkish red shorts. But it still is interesting how, given everything they had at the time, I mean... I got really frustrated researching this case, especially when I found out that the shorts were reported as pink so early on in the case, because to me, I was like, they're both wearing pink shorts, duh, obvious, but I mean, they really did go out of their way to try to cover all their bases before they made a determination one way or another that Sharon was or wasn't this little girl that they'd found, and so... While looking back, it may feel like all of the signs were there, we just have to remember that all the signs weren't there, and they really did try to, you know, investigate to the fullest extent they were able. The Arizona police, as I said, were following up on several different leads, and one of the leads they were following up on was a hitchhiking family hiking across US 89 near Prescott. The calls originally said that there was a man his wife, and five young children, three boys and two girls. When investigators found them, there was a man, his wife, three boys, and one young girl. Because of these tips, police brought in this family and arrested the man so they could begin asking him questions regarding the young girl found in the desert. He denied being anywhere near where the body had been found, but as they continued investigating him and asked him about you know, had he been anywhere near Alan McGordo, New Mexico, he did admit that he'd been there during the time that Sharon was kidnapped. Because even though investigators didn't believe that Sharon was the same girl found in the desert, they did know of her case now. And so, of course, they were going to ask this transient man if he'd been in the area because that was one of the theories of who may have taken her. And since they had originally thought there was two girls and not one girl, they were asking, you know, where's this other girl, what's going on with her, and could she have been this girl that they found in the desert. The man, whose name can be found, but I won't name him here because he was found to have no connection, and I'm sure by now he's no longer with us and can't defend his family or himself um, because there's been no connection found. I'm just not going to include his name here, but you can find it online if you want to. This man admitted that he had been in Alamogordo around the time that Sharon was kidnapped, and he actually knew her name because he'd heard about the kidnapping on TV. But then, after that, his family had decided to leave Alamogordo. He said they hitchhiked to Las Cruces, and from there they took a bus to Phoenix. And then from there, they'd just been hitchhiking along US 89. After questioning him, police found that there was no connection that they could find, at least, between him and Sharon or this young girl that was found dead, and so they released him. Around the same time that Sharon was confirmed not to be this young girl, the town of Prescott found that it was time to bury her. The town of Prescott had taken great care in looking over this young girl, although they were the ones to give her the unfortunate moniker of Little Miss Nobody. I think we can forgive them when you know that more than 70 people in the town attended her funeral because they didn't want her to be alone. Dave Paladin of KYCA radio station led a collection and several of the people in the town who could lend a hand did. For instance, there was like a florist who provided flowers and a church provided the funeral services for them. So they were able to bury her in the local cemetery. The card on her casket would read, God's little child, date of birth, unknown, date of death, unknown. Dr. Charles Franklin Parker of Congressional Church, who led the service, said this quote, 
Somewhere, someone is watching to learn what happened to a little girl left on the desert. If there has been a misdeed, probably a disquieted conscience will go on and on. And luckily, people were watching to see what would have happened to this little girl. Who could have done this? Because for years, nobody gave up searching for who she was or what could have led her to these circumstances. And because nobody ever stopped trying to figure out who Little Miss Nobody was, in 2014, the case was reopened and warmed up again so that we could begin the process of trying to run her DNA and see who she might be. At a press conference on March 15th, 2022, Lieutenant Tom Boltz of the Yavapai County Sheriff's Office made the announcement that Sharon Lee Gallegos was in fact Little Miss Nobody. In this conference, he explained that a Yavapai County cold case investigator had gone to a conference and while there, he met up with another cold case investigator from Colorado who asked him about the Little Miss Nobody case. This cold case investigator at the time didn't have any answers for him, but when he went back, he did begin looking into the case again. Because the case took place in 1960, the case hadn't yet been digitized. They'd had all their files up and until 1993 digitized, but anything after that hadn't made it in yet. So they had to go down to the basement and dig up her case file and start looking into it again. And this investigator began working with John Shannon of the Yavapai County Sheriff's Office, who's in charge of their NamUs project. After they began working on her, getting her into NamUs, they also reached out to Nick Mick, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. As they began working with Nick Mick, Nick Mick offered to exhume and fund the DNA extraction of this young girl's body. And they were able to exhume her body in 2015. And in November of 2015, the DNA testing still wasn't advanced enough for them to get a hit on who this young girl could be. Because of this lack of DNA match, in 2016, Nick Mick facilitated a forensic odontology exam where they examined the young girl's teeth and facial structure to recreate a 3D facial model of what she would have looked like. They shared this image with the public and later that year, they were informed that it was very likely that Little Miss Nobody was Sharon Lee Gallegos. With these tips coming in, the Yavapai County Sheriff's Office began looking into Sharon and if she possibly could be a match, but they knew that they would need better DNA testing before they could match anybody to the young girl who'd been buried so long ago. In this same conference, David Middleman, the CEO of Othram Labs, explained that in 2018, NECMEC reached out to them about doing the forensic testing to see if they could identify Little Miss Nobody. And so Othram only works with police and investigators. They don't have any sort of um, public clientele. They don't work with any other type of groups. They only work with investigators and police. And so they do a lot of crowdfunding to be able to do their testing. And amazingly, when they reached out to the public for funds um, to do the testing on Little Miss Nobody, they managed to do all of the crowd, get all the remaining amount they needed to do the testing in 24 hours, which I think is just awesome. It shows how much people wanted to finally give her her name back. And I think before we talk about what they did, because David really doesn't get into it into the conference, but he does make a really interesting point is that to put the discovery of Little Miss Nobody's body in place with the idea of DNA. So Watson and Crick, they actually discovered the double helix shape of DNA in 1953. And that was the first time anybody really knew what it looked like. And so she was found only seven years later. And then even in 2015, we still didn't have the DNA technology to be able to identify who this young girl was. So once again, that brings up the fact that while, and I'm saying this because I personally dealt with these feelings, is while there was a lot of frustration initially with like, how did y'all not see that this was who she was? But I don't think there was any way they could have known because, I mean, 
DNA wouldn't be thought of for years in terms of testing in humans, let alone the fact that it had really only been discovered within us about seven years beforehand. David explained that then Othram, after they got the funding they needed, were able to take DNA from Sharon's remaining relatives who are still alive. She has nieces and nephews who are still alive and one brother and they were able to take their DNA and compare it to that of Little Miss Nobody and she was in fact the young girl who was found dead in the desert nearly 10 days after she was kidnapped. And I have to say I'm very sad that Loopy and her sister never got to know what happened to her, but I'm very glad that their family has some closure. Another person who spoke at the conference was Ray Chavez, Sharon's nephew, son of Ramona, who was Sharon's older sister, who was only 15 at the time Sharon was taken. He explained that Lupi and his mother have passed away already, so they don't get to know what happened to Sharon, but his uncle lives in Germany and him and his wife Petra are still alive to hear the news. They still have many cousins and there's himself and his family obviously and while they're not currently sure what they are going to do with Sharon's body, they said that the town of Prescott has taken care of her for so long so they don't necessarily want to take her away but that they're trying to make the best decision as a family and decide what to do from there. I don't know if they've made a decision since then, but honestly, that's completely up to them. She has been away from her family long enough, so I think we should just wish them the best in making that decision and where they want to go from here. But I thought it was so beautiful listening to Ray talk about her and his family, and he seemed very happy that, you know, they finally got answers and he couldn't thank them enough for not giving up on finding what happened to Sharon. He explained that even growing up, his family was in Alamogordo was known as the family who lost this little girl who'd had Sharon taken from them. And so it wasn't something that their family spoke about a lot, but he'd heard about it. And he said he was about 12 before he really worked up the nerve to ask his mom about Sharon, about who she was and what she was like and what happened to her. And he shared these stories and so that's why we know that she was a happy, feisty little girl and he doesn't doubt at all that that's why she said that she wouldn't go with this crazy lady who was trying to take her. And he said that this had weighed on their family, obviously, and that even growing up, his mother was very protective of them and their family was just very protective of all the children overall which of course you would be i would not blame them at all for being overprotective parents he had heard good stories about sharon and was happy to pass them along to us now and he thanked everybody there by saying and i quote we as the family want to say thank you thank you for what you've done for us Thank you for keeping my aunt safe and never forgetting her. Additionally, during the press conference, Ray was asked if their family has a message for the people who took her if they're still alive today. And he asked, why? Why? Why choose her? She was... They were there for a week or two before asking questions specifically. Why take her and then 10 days later she was found deceased? I think he asked these questions as anybody would, we all have those questions of why on earth would you take this little girl and kill her? But, you know, for his family too, he said that Loopy was always sad about Sharon's death and that, you know, it had changed their family some. So I hope that we will eventually get those answers. Before we talk about what's next, I would rather talk about what really made it hard to identify Sharon at the time that her body was found. And the reason I want to talk about it, this is because there's a few things that come up in readings that I've, in some of the things I've read and in some of my research that some of it makes sense and some of it doesn't. Um, some of it I've only seen once or twice. So I really just want to sprinkle in this information, but I didn't know where else to put it. 
so let's talk about why it was so hard to identify Sharon at the time. One thing I mentioned earlier was DNA was basically non-existent in the 60s, especially not DNA testing, because the double helix had literally just been discovered within the same decade. So it really does kind of set that in perspective of, you know, any sort of decomposition would have made it hard to identify her just at any point. There's one article that I read that mentioned that there's a possibility that Sharon had been burned. They mentioned her burned remains, and I will be honest, I've not seen that anywhere else. But I'm curious if maybe that's why she was so badly decomposed 10 days after her going missing because, and I'm going to talk about this in the theory section, I actually doubt that she was dead for the full 10 days. Definitely for most of that time, but not 10 whole days. If you're thinking eight or nine days in a relatively dry climate, I don't know that much about decomposition, but I just wouldn't think that it would be so decomposed to the point where you couldn't at least sort of begin to identify her um, or come up with some sort of sketch of what she would have looked like. So I'm curious if there is any truth to the fact that she was burned and maybe that contributed to the decomposition. And if she was burned, maybe that also contributed to the fact that the, I, the, her shorts color kept changing when people talked about it. Um, like I said, in the very early days, the shorts that were found on the Jane Doe's body were described as pink. Within days, they were described as pinkish red. And only days after that, they were described as red. So I wonder if maybe there was a hard time telling what color those shorts would have actually been had they been burned. But as I said, that is only been mentioned in one source that I read. And in the press conference about the identification of Sharon, they mentioned that there's details about this case that the press conference was not the right time or place to discuss those details. So I have to wonder if they do know some of what happened to her that they just aren't discussing with the public right now because this is an open investigation. So maybe if they do have a lead or something to go off of, they're keeping that close to the chest for the time being. But I'm just, I'm curious to hear more about what they know. So another question that came up during the press conference was how the description of Little Miss Nobody versus Sharon could have been so different in terms of her height, her possible weight, things like that. So both David Middleman of Othram and Tom Boltz of Yavapai County Sheriff's Office kind of explained different aspects to this. So basically, when Sharon's body was found, she was taken to a funeral home. And in the 60s, they didn't have medical examiners, they didn't have forensic pathologists and things like that that would spread out and were, you know, mobilized to go do these types of investigations. So she was looked at by a funeral director who was very likely a mortician. So he was conducting what would be called an anthropological analysis of her body. So this anthropological analysis at the time, is it the best by any means? No. The DNA testing we have now, especially at Othram specifically, looks at thousands and thousands of data points, while anthropological analysis can only look at like 10. But it was the best they had at the time. And though their measurements and estimates were off by a lot, it wasn't anything nefarious, it wasn't, you know, bad work, it was just that this was the best they had at the time. And from here, moving forward, we have better technology to be able to do this. And now we can depend heavily on science to help us identify people. So during the conference, someone asked Lieutenant Tom Boltz, what's next? And I think we all know what's next. We have to figure out who took Sharon and why. Do I think this will be easy? No, not by any means. It has been 62 years. And because the woman and man who took her were grown adults, they are very likely dead, and unfortunately will probably never face justice. One thing that I found interesting was that Tom Boltz said, we need to find out what happened to Sharon 
in those 10 days between, you know, when she had been kidnapped and when she was found in the desert. But I don't think that's completely right. We know where she was for the majority of those 10 days. She was there in that desert, buried. And so that means she was very likely dead for the majority of that time, for her to have been decomposed to the point where they couldn't identify her. I think what we need to find out is what happened directly after she was taken. And I personally have a few theories on that. But before we talk about my theories, I want to talk about some of the theories investigators have had. At the press conference in March of this year, there was no discussion of any theories they possibly had. Um, there was, like I said, a comment that Lieutenant Boltz made that said there's a time and place and this isn't the appropriate time or place for certain details. So I have to wonder, I have to think that there is more that they know at the time. In my research, I really only found a few main theories that investigators at the time Sharon's body was discovered had. Obviously, police today may have other theories, but these are the theories that I know about and found in my research. So one of the first ones was the hitchhiking family that I mentioned earlier in the video. There could be a possibility that there was in fact a fifth child, Sharon, with them at the time, um, and that, you know, she was killed and buried and then the family moved on. There's not a lot of water to this theory. I don't think they have anything that connects this man or this specific family to Sharon, aside from the fact that he was in Alamogordo at the time that she was kidnapped, and then that he was walking across US 89 within days of when the body would have been left in Arizona. But, I mean, apparently there were multiple people in that area, moving around that area, and like I said, migrant families were very common at the time. While I think that it's a theory that I'm glad they pursued, I don't know that there's enough of anything to connect him to um, this specific case, which is why I've not included his name. Um, I kind of went back and forth on that, but I'm sure the man has passed on. And if he is involved somehow, I will leave that up to the police to make that determination. The second theory that I think really held on through all this time, um, and even through the whole investigation back in the 1960s, was that it could have been a migrant couple. You know, they could have been working in Alamogordo, saw Sharon, taken her, and killed her, and then buried her in Arizona. And the third theory is, in fact, a migrant couple and family that we'll talk about now. And the third theory, this one really sucked me in, are Richard Arlen Lindsay and Dixie Lindsay. So they are the um, mother and father of a migrant family who traveled around in the southwest region of the United States at the time. And in January of 1961, they were arrested for the rape and murder of six-year-old Rosemary Riddle. Rosemary's sad story deserves its own video, and so in the future I will be covering it. But Richard and Dixie are definitely people who should have been looked into, and luckily they were. Richard and Dixie already had three children, and at the time of their arrest, in January of 1961, Dixie was pregnant with their fourth. While I'm not completely clear on what led to their arrest, when they were arrested, Dixie and Richard quickly turned on each other. I'm going to tell you both of their stories. Um, I'm going to try not to be very graphic with it because their stories are pretty graphic. Um, but I'm going to tell you Dixie's first and then Richard's. They differ for different reasons and no matter what, they are both very guilty and I am very glad they were found and sentenced for this poor girl's death. Dixie, a large brunette woman at the time of her arrest, told investigators that it had been Richard's idea for her to go up to the mother of Rose and offer them a dollar if Rose came to help clean their house. Rose and her mother agreed and they took the young girl with them. From there, Dixie's story is that Richard drove into a field, stopped, and ordered Dixie from the car. Then he drove off further with Rose in the car. When he came back about an hour later, 
the front seat of their car was covered in blood and the little girl was gone. And she asked him what happened to her and he told her that if she asked him about it, he would do her in. Richard's story, once he heard that Dixie had turned on him, was similar, but Dixie was much more involved in his retelling. He explained that it was her idea to lure the little girl away from her mother with the promise of payment for work, and then they drove to this to a field in California. Um, this case took place in California. I don't think I mentioned that yet. And so once they got to this field, um, Dixie, he claimed, was awake in the back seat of the car while he assaulted Rose. And then he wanted to let her go, but Dixie told him that they couldn't. And if he didn't take care of her, she would. Richard claims that he tried to strangle the girl, and when that didn't work, um, Dixie killed her um, with a wrench. Sorry, I just, it's hard to think of that little girl going through that. And um, if I do tell her story, I'll give more detail, but I don't really think we need that detail at this time. So when investigators in New Mexico and Arizona like heard of this couple who could do such horrific things to a six-year-old, they both wondered, could they have killed this young girl who was found in the desert? And could they have been who took Sharon? Could this be a rash of them going, moving across the Southwest United States, taking these little girls? As a matter of fact, while they were being held in a Bakersfield prison, a picture of Dixie and Richard were sent to the Gallegos family. And while they didn't necessarily think that Dixie looked like the woman um, because she was a brunette and though she was large at the time, um, she was pregnant. So I think it would be hard to tell if she was always, you know, fat as they described her during the kidnapping or was she just larger because she was pregnant at the time and had extra weight on her body. But for Richard, they hadn't gotten this great look at the man to begin with, but what they found was that his nose was strikingly similar. It was the thing that had stuck out when Sharon had been kidnapped was this hooked nose on the man. And they said that he had the exact same nose as the man who'd been in the car. And when I heard this, um, you know, that this had happened so close and so quickly after Sharon had been kidnapped, I really dove into this theory. I read a lot about Rose's case and what happened to her, um, which is, you know, why I got a little upset. There are a lot of graphic details in that case that are really heartbreaking, but there's a lot of things that are and aren't similar at the same time. Um, as a matter of fact, I sat down and like dove into it with like a list of what I felt was similar and what wasn't. Um, and so I think you're gonna hear some of my own theories mixed in with this one just because I have to kind of explain it to flesh out the whole Lindsay theory completely. Um, so Rose was taken and immediately attacked. Um, the intention, it seems like the whole time, whether it was Dixie's or Richard's intention was she was going to be assaulted and killed. And I don't think that was the case for Sharon, very specifically that when her body was found, her hair had been cut, her hair had been tinted, her fingernails had been painted, and you know, they put on a different shirt and shoes for her. They went out of their way to change her appearance. Whoever took Sharon changed her appearance to the furthest extent that they really could on short notice. Just like make her look different. And this was not the case with Rosemarie. She was taken, raped, and murdered very quickly, all within the same day. Another thing that stuck out to me was that the woman who took Sharon was described as a fat woman. And so whenever I heard for, at first that Dixie was pregnant with their fourth child, I was like, what if she wasn't fat? What if she had been pregnant? But Sharon was taken in July of 1960, and in January of 1961, 
when Dixie was arrested, she was pregnant. Um, so given a six month span, I don't think that the fatness that was described by um, the children and witnesses at Sharon's abduction could be explained by Dixie's being pregnant because, you know, she may have just been a heavy set woman all the time. I'm not completely sure. Um, but definitely pregnancy wouldn't have attributed that because even if she was very pregnant in January, she would not have been very pregnant in July the year before. So another similarity that I noticed between these two cases was that at Sharon's, um, er, where Sharon's body was found, there was a knife found nearby. Now, we don't know if the knife is what was used to murder her, um, but additionally in Rose's um, case, the wrench that was used to kill her was found near her body. Um, so that would be a similarity that the weapons were left at the scene. Another similarity would be that they were both left in out of the way places. Um, Rosemary was left in a field in California, uh, about 60 miles away from where she'd been found. And um, Sharon's body would have been found in the desert about 500 miles away from her home. So a distance, yes, but both left off the beaten path. One thing I found interesting was that it was said multiple times that Sharon's kidnappers were seen with children at certain times, I think two children. Um, and so it is possible that, you know, if we knew what these kids of Richard and Dixie's looked like, maybe there was a freckle face boy that was with them, um, that was their child. And so that it could explain why these children were seen with um, the kidnappers if that was in fact them. The biggest difference that sticks out to me between Rose's case and Sharon's case is that I don't think the people who murdered Sharon planned on murdering her. I really think that they intended to keep her, whether that be as a daughter or for much more horrific things, um, whether they were you know, trafficking, or they wanted her for themselves to molest and rape, um, I'm not sure. But I do know that Sharon's appearance was changed, and I think that's what sticks out to me the most. Like I said, her fingernails and toenails were painted, her hair was cut, and her hair was dyed. Um, and so that really says to me that they were trying to keep her from being recognized um, so that they could keep her themselves. So as I mentioned, like Rose's death seemed planned, like that was the plan from the very beginning to take her, rape her, and murder her. I don't think that was the case in Sharon's abduction. I truly think they were planning on keeping her. Um, I'm not completely sure why, but I think that that was the plan. Another similarity between these cases, though, is that Richard, if we believe him, or if what he's saying is true, um, claimed that Dixie was pretty involved in the case um, of Rose. So if she was that involved, if she was that hands-on with what they did to Rose, she, I have no doubt that she would have been willing to get out of the car and snatch Sharon, um, despite there being witnesses. Unfortunately, though, I don't know that we'll ever get an answer on if they were involved in not or not. Um, at the time, Dixie and Richard both denied being involved, and the Gallegos family and all the witnesses that day could not clearly say that they were the people who took Sharon. Um, I do believe that Richard Lindsay was um, executed for his crimes very shortly after. Um, he was found guilty in 1961, or he pled guilty. Um, but I do know he has since been executed. I'm not completely sure what happened to Dixie, um, but I don't think we'll ever get answers from them themselves if they were involved. Um, and because of that, I don't, while this seems like it could be a good theory, 
I just don't think it lines up completely. Unfortunately, I think there were more, there was more than one monster taking children at that time, which is just so sad to think about. And so now that brings us to my theory and what could have happened to Sharon and why she was taken. Um, I'm not going to go crazy speculating. I kind of have covered everything already talking about the Lindsay, um, you know, the, the Lindsay's and what they did. But the things that stick out to me the most um, are that Sharon's appearance was changed. I think that is what makes me think that her death was unplanned. Um, if you were just planning on killing her and getting out of Dodge, why would you change her appearance, drive her 500 miles away, and then just dump her body? That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, so I have a feeling that they fled changed her appearance somewhere along the way or when they got where they were going in Arizona. And then I have to think something happened. Um, I mentioned this at the beginning of the video that I was very excited about how quickly police sprung into action for this case, especially in the 60s. Um, I mean, it's kind of hard to deny that they needed to spring into action considering multiple people saw Sharon get yanked out of her own like back alley um, but still this was a not wealthy Hispanic family in the 60s there was a very good chance that the police weren't going to immediately spring into action unfortunately um, and so I have to wonder if maybe because the people who took her were white they possibly thought that the police wouldn't spring into action that maybe they would ignore uh, the fact that a young Hispanic child was taken and just forget about it. Um, and that's not what happened. They sprang into action. Her, I mean, I saw newspaper clippings the day after um, she was taken, like all the way to Montana. And I think even a couple days after that, I read one in Florida. I mean, people were spreading that she had been taken from her home. And so there was really nowhere to escape with her that someone wouldn't have at least printed a newspaper clipping. And so I wonder if maybe how much publicity the case got took them off guard completely. Another possible issue could have been that Sharon was feisty. She had refused to go with them from the beginning. And there's a very good chance that she may have thrown fit after fit, have been screaming we don't know what she was doing to cause a fuss for them because she did not want to go with him. So maybe they thought because she was so young, they would be able to scare her into compliance. And then, you know, by the time they got her where they wanted to go, changed her appearance some and were ready to move on to the next thing, they realized that they could just not control her and this was not going to work. So they had to um, kill her and dispose of her, unfortunately. Sharon being so feisty kind of plays into another theory. Um, maybe she was determined to hurt them and fight them and do whatever she needed to do. Um, so perhaps she was fighting them really hard and was accidentally hurt and killed. Um, I think... So there's a few things that confuse me about the evidence that was found near her body. For one, there's no description of like copious amounts of blood found around her body, um, which you would think it would have been um, had she been stabbed by that knife that they found nearby. The other thing that kind of gives me pause about what her cause of death could be is that when police described the area she was found in, there was both a man's footprints and her footprints with those little flip-flops that had been cut into sandals to fit her feet. And because both these footprints were there, that tells me that this is very likely the murder site where she was killed if she walked herself to this area. Um, but then that doesn't make a lot of sense if the knife was the murder weapon, that it doesn't look like it's a crime scene so much as a dumping site. Um, so you have to wonder, 
was it was it strangulation, suffocation, something along those lines? I think there are things that make it hard to theorize what happened in this case because it is so limited what we do know about Sharon's kidnapping and about where her body was found. Um, I hope that the police have a lot more information than I have because I still have so many questions. Um, that would help me formulate a better theory. But I think what I'm sticking to is that it was not planned that she would be murdered um, and that that was, in fact, something that came as an afterthought because of something else. So what's next? Where do we go from here with Sharon's case? Um, I think that's a hard question. You know, it's 62 years after she was taken. Additionally, and Lieutenant Tom Boltz talks about this in the press conference, that all of the evidence from her case was stored in a vault. And while they thought they were doing the best they could at the time, vaults don't allow for much airflow. And because of that lack of airflow, all of the evidence for Sharon's case molded and they had to make the decision to throw it away because it would no longer be usable. Um, so we don't have the clothing she was wearing. There's no possibility of DNA being found on those clothes. I think it's going to be really hard for them to find out what happened to her and going from where they are now, I hope that with the evidence they do have and maybe with the help of her family, they will possibly get answers. Um, I know that the sheriff's office mentioned they would love to be able to talk to the children who were in that car that day. Um, they do believe that the freckle-faced boy was in the car with her, um, but there additionally could have been a young girl. Um, she was also seen with them at certain times. Um, and so I'm hoping that one or both of those children may still be alive today and be able to come forward and give information because I do think that the adults who took Sharon at the time are probably long dead, unfortunately. The other thing that really sticks out to me about my theory of I don't think her death was part of the plan was that they stalked her for days beforehand. You know, this wasn't they saw a cute girl that they wanted to kidnap and so they grabbed her and ran and then, you know, t you did whatever they wanted to do and then killed her. That wasn't the case. They stalked her, they asked around about her, they watched her, they watched her family, and then finally they took her at the risk of leaving multiple witnesses and even being chased down. Like they took her and ran off and then hid her identity. And so I have to think that there was more to their plan than to just end Sharon's life after they kidnapped her. But I do hope that if um, the boy or girl who were with the people who took Sharon that day ever hear about this case or I doubt they'll ever see my video but if they see something about her to reach out I mean I know it, they're very likely your parents um, which is just so unfortunate but I hope that even if you loved them and even if you thought they were good people that you'll say something because there is still family members who need answers for Sharon um, her brother is still alive her nieces and nephews still know about her and care about her and want to know what happened. They want to know why this happened. Um, and I think that's what the police investigation will have to focus on now is why this happened. And hopefully that will lead us to who did it. Um, as I said, Sharon's story is very short, unfortunately. But she has been surrounded by people her whole life who loved her and didn't want to give up on her, um, which is why the town of Prescott took her in their hearts and made sure to bury her correctly. And that's why the Yavapai County Sheriff's Office never gave up on figuring out who she was. And thankfully, we never have to call her that unfortunate name again. She can now just be Sharon and 
she wasn't nobody. She was this beautiful, sweet little girl who was loved by her family, whose life was ended in the worst way possible. And with that, I think I'm going to end the video here. Please be sure to like and subscribe. Additionally, if you'd like to know more about the sources I used or check out the um, press conference for yourself, it was really interesting. I'm going to link those both down below. And I'm looking forward to covering the next case with you. Bye!